Test, test, test. Test, test, test. Here we go. Gain, gain. Yeah, that's true enough. Okay, I got, I got to just concentrate on this for the minute. Uh, do you have a place where I can connect these? Uh, that last one is not used. Okay, cool. Yeah. I'll run the okay, I got to I got to concentrate on this for a second, Leo. Um, I've got a picture in picture, and um, Okay, is the mic on? It is, great stuff. Now, Leo, can you just check the stream? Leo, can you just check the um, audio on the stream? Can you just check the audio on the stream? Okay, yeah. All good? All right, folks. 
I think I'll make a start. Welcome back to Comp 1110. It's great to see you here in person. Um, it's wonderful to be in a lecture theatre with real people in it. And um, yeah, and uh, thanks for coming into the room. And for those of you who are on the live stream, um, thank you for joining us. Uh, we had some issues with Microsoft Streams last on Monday, and it turned out that everyone I know who's an academic had a problem with Microsoft Streams. So there, there are some issues there. We're going to try our luck this. Uh, this time around, um, hopefully uh, it will work, but nonetheless, uh, YouTube and Twitch, you can get the, catch the stream there, and then there's a screen recording which you can catch later. Now, first of all, let's get into some admin. Um, you should, it's very, very important in this class, I emphasized in the last class, that we have a really fast start, right? Really fast start, it means you've got to get a lot of stuff done in week one, it's not very exciting stuff, it's getting familiar with the tools, getting familiar with your labs and all that sort of stuff. It's essential you get that done, okay? So if you haven't done it, it's critical that you somehow or other catch up with your tutor and um, get that squared away ASAP because you can't progress through the course unless you've done these things. Um, the scheduled labs start next week on Tuesday, nine o'clock is the first lab. You should have enrolled in the lab class. There are slots available still in most labs, so if you didn't get the time you wanted, you should just go and check, because there may be a slot available right now. People come and go from the course, so availability in classes changes as we go along. So uh, please check that out. Um, now, as I said in Piazza, and as I said on Monday's lecture, if you have problems that mean it's really hard for you to come and join the class, um, at, the time, at the time that's available, just let me know and I'll do whatever I can to get you into a class that works for you, okay? Um, Piazza, everyone here should have got an invitation to join Piazza. That's where all the important messages are happening, so please make sure you're reading what, whatever's on there. Absolutely make sure you read instructor notes there because I'll tell you critical things like the assignment's been cancelled or the question is wrong or something like that. And if you miss it, then you might be in big trouble, okay? So please make sure you read it. No, the assignment hasn't really been cancelled. I was just saying like, like that, right? Just, just a joke. Um, the assignment will be uh, announced on Monday, will be released on Monday right before this class. So right before this class uh, in, uh, on Monday, the assignment will be released. The content of the assignment will include things that we're going to teach on Monday. All right, um, I think that's about it. And with that, we're gonna go back to where we were on Monday, Monday's lecture. And we were talking about uh, introductory Java. We went through all this, and just one second, I need to bring up my Piazza page over here. Um, we were talking about all this, this here, and we, um, uh, we, went, we, we went through these slides, and we talked about naming, modules, packages, variables. Um, naming for um, the, the, the case sensitivity and so forth in Java names, capitalization conventions, all this sort of stuff, primitive data types, we quickly touched on all this. And then finally we got to um, the mini quiz, which I did not release, um, and some of you, uh, oh, I have released it now, okay, so it's just released, so it's, I'll reopen it, there it is, it's open now. Um, there it is, there's the mini quiz. If you haven't done the uh, J03 mini quiz, you can do it now, I don't think I released it during the lecture. I'll generally release them during the lectures. Um, now what we're going to do is um, some, some uh, we didn't finish all the coding we're going to do in the J03 unit, so we're going to do that right now, okay? So we're going to jump back into the coding. Um, some of you will remember that, we, um, that we, we started off looking at how strings were made. In this example here, we declared a variable x, assigned it to a value, which was hello, and then we printed it out and so forth. And we walked through this in the Waterloo Visualizer. And we're going to continue with this uh, now um, with some other types. This is about strings, and we're going to introduce new types. And uh, what we're going to do after strings is integers. Now, one little subtle and interesting thing is you may have noticed the name of this class is not string, but strings. Okay, I could have actually called it string if I wanted to, but it may have confused you. It wouldn't have confused the computer because string is a special, as you can see right here, string is a special um, type in Java. And um, uh, so naming a class the same name as a special type could be confusing. But because of packages, this would not just be string, it would be Comp 1110 Lectures J03 string. So it actually, the compiler, the computer wouldn't be confused, but it might have confused you. That's why I use the word strings as my, the name for my example program rather than calling it string, okay? Just in case you were wondering why I call it that. Um, now, what I'm going to do is create a new class here, uh, if I can, file, new class, oops, it's just a bit slow here, new Java class, 
and we're going to call it integers. Same pattern. We could have called it integer, but we're going to call it integers, okay, just to avoid confusion with the, um, with the Java class of that name. So there it is, integers, and, and we're going to add it to git, and now we're going to start uh, writing a program. And what's the first thing I do? Can anyone remember what that magic incantation is I do in, in, um, to, to create a main program for any program in, uh, in, in, in Java? What do I do? Can anyone remember? You've got to write all that stuff. Prior, uh, public, static, void, main, and so forth. Right? Do you remember how we do this succinctly? Yep. Yeah, that's a shortcut, right? I'll just type PSVM, PSVM like that, and then press enter, and uh, IntelliJ does the magic there. So we're just going to do that. Now we're going to declare a variable just like we did in the strings, but this time it's an integer, okay? And um, the, the integer here is going to be equal to uh, some number, like one, two, three. But we can also make this a longer number and illustrate the fact that underscores in Java don't matter. They just get, they just get removed. So if we want to make our number look pretty, we, f we think it looks better like this, we can just put an underscore in there for some reason if we want. Okay, we don't need to put it in there, but we can if we wish. And then we can uh, print that out. And to print something out, we just type S-O-U-T and then enter and uh, IntelliJ does an autocomplete for us. And we'll say X, X, like that. And then we'll do a string concatenation. That's what that plus sign there is meaning. And then actually print the value of X. And now I'll save that and then I'll run it. And the way I'll run it was, is do a right, right mouse click here. If I can, oh, I'm pressing the wrong button. There we go. And we'll run the main program like that. And what should happen is it should print out the number um, 123,567. Okay? And let's see, it's a bit slow here. Look down here, it tells us that it's, it's working on it. It's building it. And there we go. And it says X colon space one, two, three, six, uh, five, six, seven, which is exactly what we expect from this. Okay. And now I'll do a couple more examples here. We can make a new variable. So I'm declaring a variable here. We're calling it Y. And we're going to make a binary number. Remember, I said that we can declare, we can write our numbers in different bases. The default base, of course, is um, base 10, which is what we're all familiar with. But we can use other bases. So, so for example, if we can, we can do this, we can say 0B and then write a binary number, right? So we can do a number like this like that, and it will turn that binary number into a, a decimal number, and we can, if we print it out, it'll, of course, by default, print that out in decimal. So we go like this, and like that. Now, I want to remind everyone who's on the stream, you should be on Microsoft Teams, and Leo is down the front here, and he's taking your questions. So if you have any questions and you're on the stream, please um, let Leo know, and Leo will voice it. I can see a question in the front here. Yep. Yeah, if you want to, uh, the, I think the question was about this, this line here, and the answer is this part here is the magical part that tells Java the stuff that's following is in binary. Sometimes we want to write in binary. Normally in this class you won't be doing that, but I'm just showing you an example. You could also do hexadecimal and other bases. But by default, if you don't put that stuff in front, it's going to say, okay, this is a decimal number, which is what we normally use. Yep. Can you speak up? Um, Java does have maxim maximums in terms of the numbers, and it's not about binary or decimal, it's actually about the type. And the type here, where are we? There. That, the answer to your question is on this slide here. The question was, does binary have a maximum number? And the answer is, binary doesn't have a maximum number, but ints do. So an int here has a maximum number of 2 to the um, uh, 31 minus 1. Okay? 2 to the power 31 minus 1 is the maximum number we can represent here. Okay? So um, that's the answer to that question. And where's my cursor? There it is. And if we run this program, we should see that number get printed out. Now, it'll get printed out in decimal. So let's just see how this goes. And there we are, 48. So this is the number 48 in binary, and it gets printed out. Um, now, the last thing I'm going to show you is how we can read a number in from a string, right? So if I write a number um, in a string, like 2, 3, you all know what 2, 3 means. It means 23, right? But you can, um, if someone gives you a string, you need to be able to convert that into the number 23. Because until you do that, it's just two letters. The letter representing the number 2 and the letter representing the number 3. And so Java just looks at that as being letters 2 and 3, not a number 23. Okay? So we can fix that by using um, a thing called parseInt. So what we're going to do here is we're going to declare a string. String s equals 
2, 3. And then we can say um, int z equals uh, integer, integer dot parse int. Notice, by the way, as I'm typing, you, you can't see my hands. None of you can see my hands. But as I'm typing, I'm getting IntelliJ to finish things off because it's often guessing what I want to type. And I just hit enter, and it keeps finishing things off, right? That's just a, a useful tip. So we look here, and um, there we go. And why is it graded out? Normally, it oh, <laughs> it's graded out because it's graded out because I'm doing something very silly. I'm parsing myself because I, I mistyped, right? Notice that there's a little squiggly red line. There, IntelliJ is helping us out. So can you see the bug there? You, can, can you see what I should have typed? Anyone, can anyone see what I did wrong? Yeah, I should have typed S because I wrote S as the name of the string, and that's what I actually intended, but I mistyped and I typed Z. Okay, so you can see IntelliJ is pretty clever because it figured out I made a mistake. It grayed out the part that was, was, was silly and put a little squiggly line under the part that I did wrong. So keep your eye out for that when you're working because it'll help you debug things, right? And I'm going to make loads of mistakes in my classes and um, you're going to watch IntelliJ help us out with that. See, now it's gone back to black because I'm actually writing something sensible. And now we can print that out and we just type that little incantation S out. I press enter and we'll say um, Z colon plus Z like that. All right, and then we run this, and now all I need to do is hit the run button up there, and it's going to run integers, and we see here it's building it down there, down at the bottom of the screen, and hopefully we'll get the number 23, which is the integer that corresponds with the string 2, 3. Question down the front. Also, what happens if you replace the integer char in the string f? If I make this a char? If I just put something nonsense in here, like um, 20. Yeah. OK, let's see what happens, folks. This is a good question, right? Great question. The question is, what happens if I put something strange like that in? Can anyone guess? Here. Who's got suggestions on what's going to happen now? Error. Pardon? Throw an error. It will throw an error, right? A little bit of a tantrum from the, um, from the computer. Let's see what happens. You'll get really used to this, because this is going to happen to you lots and lots, right? It's the way it, see, it says exception. For input string 20, right? And it says here, it's not what it, it says, number format exception. It says this number is not formatted correctly. That's because it's not a number, right? It's a, a, it's a word, in English, word 20. Okay? So, great question, and you can see what happens. If you type the wrong thing in, um, it won't recognize it. But if we put back a, a number in there, a string which happens to correspond to a number, then it will consume that and turn it into a, a number. Question? If I put an underscore there, that's a good question. I have no idea what the answer to that is. Let's just try it out. If we put a space, I know what's going to happen. I think you'll find that this will cause an exception as well. So that's not a number. It's got spaces in it. And we already know that spaces shouldn't be in there, I think. Let's just see. We're running it. And it says, no, no, you can't do that. All right. So, um, and, but let's try the underscore because we know that for a literal, you can put an underscore. I'm not sure for a string that you can put a, 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 an underscore. This is not a this is not a literal, this is a string. So my guess is this is going to fail, but it might work. It's a, it's a good question. It's a great question. Let's have a look here. It's a building, and yeah, it does not like that, okay? But, you know, what I was just illustrating there, folks, some of you are thinking, my God, there's so much stuff here. How does Steve know it all? I don't, right? Um, the question came, and the only way I could answer it is by trying it out and finding the answer out for myself. And I really want you to develop that fearlessness. It's like, oh, what does this do? Just try it out and see what happens. Maybe it'll break, but it's probably not going to catch on fire, okay? It'll probably just say, hey, that's not right. All right? So you've got to be fearless here and, and try stuff out. And we're going to do this a lot in the lectures. All right? So next, we're done with the integers. We have to move pretty fast here, folks. There's so much to cover. It's, it's pretty simple stuff. Um, really, well, not simple. It's foundational stuff, right? It's really basic stuff. And by the time you get to week four, this will just be so passe. You, you, you'll, you'll be surprised that we were doing this in week one. But right now, you're probably feeling a little bit overwhelmed. Don't worry about it. We're going to iterate. We're going to go again and again over this stuff. This is really foundational, okay? And not every single piece in here is going to be explained. There's stuff here which will be mysterious to you. Don't worry. The mystery will slowly disappear. It won't completely disappear. I'm a professor. I've been teaching this class for 10 years. There's still mystery in here, okay? It's a very, very complex world, and there's lots of complexity in here. And I'm not promising you that I'll get rid of all that mystery. It's not going to happen, sadly. <laughs> all right. You know, um, back in the old days, computers were a lot simpler and um, we could approach things rather differently. But nowadays, some of our software is so complex, like uh, I told you I worked in Munich um, uh, a summer ago, and um, 
this code base, there was millions of lines of code, and no one could, no single person knew, knew all of it. No way, you couldn't possibly do it. No human being could do that. These things become so complex, they're almost, almost organic, right, in terms of the level of complexity. So we have to view them that way. So yeah, the, the idea that you can understand everything is unfortunately not one that we can come at. All right, now we're gonna do the booleans. Same thing, I've added the S there to differentiate it from the actual type boolean. Now I'm gonna do the same incantation again. You guys are gonna get really familiar with this. PSVM, press enter, and it writes that boilerplate code. And now we're gonna declare a boolean. Instead of doing a string or a, um, a string or an integer, we're, a string or an int, we're gonna do a boolean, and we're say, it's gonna say A. Now what can A be? It can be either true or false, okay? And um, we can write it like this, true, there it is. And, um, and then what we can do is we can print that out and we can say A colon and then again string concatenation. That plus sign here means glue together two strings. And Java behind the scenes is gonna turn that A, which is a Boolean, into a string, which will spell out T-R-U-E, right? Which is the, the value we, we actually want. We can run this now. We go here, uh, there it is, run it. And we'll see A getting printed out. And you can see down the bottom there, it's working away. There it is, A is true. And now what we're gonna do is we're going to um, declare another Boolean, B, and what value could this take on that's not true? Well, there's only two values of Booleans. Hopefully everyone here is familiar with Booleans. Booleans are these special types that you, hopefully you've encountered these before. If you haven't, they're a very special type that's really important in computer science. They can take on exactly two different values, true, and false, that's it, that's all they can do, true and false. So if it's not true, it's gonna be false, okay? So um, there it is, it's false, and then we do it, print that one out, and we say um, B, and now what we're gonna do after this, we'll run this, uh, save that and run it, and what we're gonna do in a moment is the same as what we did with the integer, we're gonna write a string, true, T-R-U-E, and use the parse boolean to read that in and turn that string, which is a pile of characters, into a Boolean value, and then we'll print that one out, okay? So um, there we go, and that, the B came out as false, and now what we're gonna do is say um, uh, string, string, which is a pile of characters, equals um, true, and what's interesting here, someone asked before about the formatting of the string, one thing that's interesting is we can format this however we like in terms of case, so we can write, you know, slightly crazy um, case here. It has to be spelt correctly, I'm not a very good speller. Um, but, um, and spelling does matter here. There we go, there's our string. Oh, I have to declare which, what the name of the variable is. So, remember, the, the thing on the left there, string, is what type it is, it's a string. The thing on the, uh, here is C, saying what the name of this variable is, and the thing on the right there is what we're assigning to it. And now what we can do is we can say, um, actually we call that S for string, right? S, and then we can say boolean, boolean C equals, um, boolean dot parse boolean, and then we'll give it the string. And so it's gonna turn that string, which is a pile of characters, into a true false value, and then we'll print it out. Okay, it's out like that, Let's see. And run that, and then we're gonna skip along, because there's lots to get done here, and we're gonna do, um, next thing we're gonna do is doubles, okay? Now a double is a type of floating point number, and what happened there? It printed it out. Notice it turned this T-R-U-E with a upper and lower casing into this simple value here, true. And I didn't print it out the way I really should have, which is to add in this extra bit to make it look a little bit nicer. C colon like that, and a string concatenation, which is that plus sign, which is gluing together the two strings. And we'll run it again, and then we'll move on and we'll do doubles now, okay? Doubles are um, a, a way of representing floating point numbers, okay? And we flip back to that PowerPoint slide that I was on a moment ago. There you go, there's the doubles. So we just did, we did int, we did boolean, and we're about to do double, okay? Double is a floating point number, okay? And we'll go back to, yep. I've got, I've got a question from Adam. Um, he asks, do all Java programs need to be main method inside Kotlin? Right, great question. Um, the question is, do all Java programs need to have a main method inside the class? And the answer is, if it's a program, it does. Somewhere, some, you've got to have a main method, okay? But we can have classes that are not programs. So we can have a program that is built up of multiple classes and only one of those classes might actually be the, have the main method in it, okay? And you'll see that with your assignment. With your assignment, you'll get lots of classes and only one of them has the main method in it, okay? Or maybe none of them does for the assignment, as a matter of fact, because it's using JavaFX, which we'll get to later. 
but if you want to execute the program, unless it's JavaFX, if you want to execute the program somewhere, one of the classes is going to have to have a main method. Okay? And at the beginning of this course, mostly I'm just going to write simple programs like this, which have a main method at the beginning. But as you move on, as we move on this semester, we're going to have richer things which have multiple classes and they don't all have a main method. Just the one that we want to execute does. Okay? So what the main method does is it means this is a class that we can run as a program. That's what it's doing. So great question. Thank you, Leo. Okay, uh, let's get back here. We're going to create a new one called doubles. Again, folks, if you're online, um, don't hesitate to ask your question. That was a really good question there. And remember, if you're online, that there is a, um, depending on whether you're watching on Twitch or um, YouTube, there's quite a few second delay. So if you ask a question, it'll be a little while before I get around to answering it, uh, just because of the delay in the system. But I will try and answer it as promptly as I can. Okay, so now we're going to write a very similar thing. We're going, to, we're going to mess around with some doubles. And first of all, we declare a variable x, just like we did in the others. Double. Notice it, it even does auto-completion for the type names. I just type D-O-U and it says, okay, you want a double. X equals, and then I'll write a double here. And we'll say 3.1, like that. We can make it whatever we want. And then we'll just print that out. S out. And we'll say uh, x colon and then string concatenation again and get it to print out that x. Now, what's going on behind the scenes here, and we're going to become more and more clear about this later as we go through the semester, is that x there, which is a double, is actually getting transformed into a string by underlying magic within Java. So it turns into a string, and then we've got our own string, which is x colon space, and then it's gluing them together with a plus sign. Okay? Um, then um, what we do is a double y. We'll make, oh, sorry, I didn't run that. Whoops, whoops, whoops. We're going to learn about do loops later, but not today's lecture. Okay, all right. So now let's run this thing and um, run doubles.main. And, oh, notice that. By the way, this is partly the answer to the last question we had from online. Notice that when I did a right mouse click here and went run, notice it says run doubles.main. Okay, it was only going to execute the class because it had a main method, which is this thing here, which goes back to the answering the question that, that, that we got asked online. Okay, so we've run it and it says x colon 3.1. Now we can make a y here. Now, one of the things we can do is we can use scientific notation if we want, right? You probably learned scientific notation at high school um, or somewhere else, and you could write a, a number like this, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, um, and then what do we do? We say something like e to the minus 7 or something like that, right? So that's a scientific notation way of representing a floating point number, right? You familiar with that? So this is scientific notation. And then we can do the same thing. We can go s out and then, oops, oops, s out. There we go. Um, and then we'll say um, y, y, if I can just type it, um, plus y, and it will, should print out that, that number, okay? We'll do that, and then finally, we'll do the same thing as we did before, whereas we're going to create a string that looks like a, a double, and we will um, turn that into a double using parse int, a uh, parse string, a uh, parse double, sorry. Okay, notice here, it actually printed out slightly differently to what we did. Okay, it used a capital E. That's because it's doing it in its own format. All right, and, and, um, and, but you can see it's the same value. All right, and then finally, we, um, we're going to do uh, a string, so string s equals 3.123 or 124 or something, whatever. 1, 2, 3. And then what we're going to do is we're going to turn that into a double by saying um, a double z equals, um, what is it? Can anyone tell me? Can anyone guess? Can, you guys are like, uh, you can learn from what we did before. What, what do you think this is going to be? What's your best guess? I'm going to type double, yeah. Yeah, and then what I'm going to type? What was it? Someone said something. I heard someone say something. Parse double, dot parse double. That's right. Yep, okay. So you guys should slowly get the hang of what I'm doing here. There's a lot of patterns. It's not just chaos. There's, there are patterns underlying all this, okay? So we do that, and then we can print this out, okay? So print it out, and we get Z, and then a colon, and then plus Z. Like, whoops. Caps, did I hit caps lock? No, there we are. All right, and then we're done. Okay, let's see this get printed out. There it is. So we've got our number, it's being, we're writing it as a string, a pile of characters. Java is taking that pile of characters, figuring out what it means as a number, turn it into the number Z, and then we're saying, hey, take that number Z and print it, which means take that number Z, turn it back into a string, and then we'll print that string out. Okay, 
So that's what's going on there. And with that, we're done. I see. Yep. Oh, great question. So the question from Hu Yong is what the difference is between a string and a char. And there are lots of different important ways to answer that question. One is actually on the screen right now, um, and that is that um, a char is a primitive type. See that up on the screen there? A char is a primitive type, and um, that means it's not a class. A string is a class. So a string is actually an object. And a char represents exactly one letter, one Unicode letter. Okay, that's what a char is. A string is a whole lot of those uh, together, which we use, say, for an English or in any language to represent a word or something like that. Okay, so a string is a series of letters. Okay, now in some languages, like C, for example, um, a string is simply an array of char. In this language, in Java, it's not an array of char. It's a special class called string with a whole lot of features and things that you can do with the string. Okay? And so it's a little different. It's a great question. We're going to come closer to answering that question better as the semester goes on. But they're fundamentally different. One way to think of it is a char is a primitive type, a string is a class. That's one relevant dimension to it. It's a multi-dimensional answer. One dimension is one's an actual type called string. And how do you know it's how how are, how are types differentiated from primitive types? Can it, has anyone noticed a pattern here? Yep. Capitalization, yeah. So the string had a capital S, if you were noticing, whereas here, all these primitive types, if you look up on the screen there, they've all just got a lowercase name, right? So that's one, one dimension to it. And another dimension to it is um, that a string is a rich thing which you can call methods on. You can't call methods on these primitive types. We're going to come back to that later because I haven't even told you what a method is yet. Uh, soon we'll come to that, but that's part of the answer to your question. Okay, great question. Another question. Another question, my goodness. Yep. Yeah, if, um, how does rounding work? Uh, good question. So if, if, we, if, if we type the number in here, like that, um, let's just see what happens. I mean, again, like the other person's question. I don't know exactly how it works, but there's a very concrete answer to your question. There's a very, very simple technical answer to your question, and that is it uses, um, where are we, is it running? It's still building. Let's just see what happens here. Okay. There you go. All right, so you get 31945, and here we had 31946. Look at that. All right, that's answering that person's question exactly. You can see here, I'll, I'll put it back on side by side so they can see it better. Um, but, but what you see here is that these, that last digit has been rounded in some interesting and strange way. How did that happen? Well, we're going to explain more about that later, but the, the key idea that you need to understand is that in computers, um, numbers have a fixed amount of precision. And you can see it right here, what the precision is. We can only represent as many numbers as we can with 64 bits of data, okay? We're not gonna dive into that right here in this lecture, but that limits what we can represent, okay? We can't represent every possible number, not possible, okay? Because you've gotta be able to fit it into 64 bits, which means there's a fixed number of, of numbers that you can represent. And as you just saw, the computer rounded, or Java rounded, or did some sort of rounding, did, did some, it actually truncated, right? It did some operation there, and, and we lost that last digit. That was a fantastic question from the, from the stream, and you can see here how I answered it. I answered it two ways. Look, let me, let me go back to my answer. This is the concrete technical answer. Whoops, I can't highlight, can I? The concrete technical answer to that person's question is right on the screen there. A, a double in Java is defined by the standard. There's a standard called the IEEE 754. You can go read it. It's pages and pages long. It explains exactly the answer to this question. Very, very technical. But broadly speaking, we've got a fixed number of bits and the computer will have to jam whatever we want into that limited number of bits. And that means sometimes you'll get rounding. Okay? And the exact rules for rounding, when you do multiply and divide and so forth, they're actually quite complicated and arcane. And we're not going to go into it in this course, but a fantastic question. All right. Any last questions on that? Otherwise, I'm going to rip ahead because we've got so much to do in this class. Um, all right, J4, uh, we're going to move on and we're going to talk about arrays. That's a really key concept in Java or in any programming language, usually. We're going to talk about operators, expressions, statements, blocks, and we're also going to talk about random. Okay, not random stuff, but the actual class called random in Java. And so let's look at this. Okay, Java arrays. An array in Java holds a fixed number of values of a given type or its subtype that can be accessed with an index, okay? So it's like a, um, 
in, in loose, loose English terms, it's a bit like a list if you want to think of it that way. It's not the same thing as a list. List actually has a technical meaning in Java and an array is not a list. But if you want to think colloquially or you know, roughly speaking, it's a whole bunch of things in a row, um, which we call an array. And um, that, but, the, but, but the important thing is everything in the array has to be the same type or a subtype of that. Okay, and we're going to come to types in more detail soon. You already saw the example I talked about in Monday's lecture where we talked about the bicycle and the very general type. What was the most general thing in, in Java? What do we call it? We don't call it a thing. What do we call it? Java lang object, right? That's the most general thing. In English, we use the word thing if we're not being at all specific, right? We say thing. Um, if we're being more specific, we might say fruit. If we're being more specific still, we might say apple. If we're being really specific, we'll say pink lady or, or granny smith, right? So this is more and more specific. And in Java, it's object at the top, okay? And what this thing here says is that everything in the array, when you declare the array, everything you shove in it has to be of the type that you declare or one of its subclasses, okay? So if I, and, and there's, arrays can be made up of primitives. We just saw the primitives, that's int, that's a double and so forth. Or they can be made up of rich objects like strings or you could create yourself an object. We're going to do this later. Things like animal, dog, cat and so forth. And you could have an array of dogs and cats. How would I, how would I have an array which held both dogs and cats in it according to that rule that's on the screen there? If I wanted an array that had dogs and cats, anyone at the back of the room? Yeah, over there. You have to, you have to shout because I'm hard of hearing. Oh man, I still can't hear. That air conditioning is so loud. Sorry. Make an array of strings. You could make an array of strings, but then they wouldn't be cats and dogs. They'd be words. They might be names of cats and dogs if they were strings. That's a great, great answer. Okay. So if I made an array of strings, I could have Fido and, you know, Spot and so forth. That would be the names of the cats and dogs. But if I actually want to have a cat and a dog, which has an age, a, you know, a specific breed and all that sort of stuff, right? Describing the cat or describing the dog, including a name. If I want to have the actual dog object or the cat object, um, this rule says they, that we can't have different types in the same array, and, but there's an unless there. Yeah? Um, you, you do it in such a way that the dogs and cats are consistent of a different kind of object? Yeah, let, go ahead. Yep, you're, you're on the right track here. Uh, so if you have an object, if you define an object, let's say any animal object, and you define, let's say, um, let's say a dog and a cat is an instance of that object, then you can have dogs and cats. And right. So um, the answer over there for those who didn't hear or who are on the stream is that what if the cat and the dog are both of type animal or maybe of type pet or something like that, they both share that, that ancestor type, that is their class, their subtypes of pet or subtypes of animal, say, then you could make the array of animal. That way you could wedge in your cat and your dog and there's no problem according to the rule that's above me, right? Because, it's, because they're both subtypes of that. But you couldn't just say this is an array of cat and then try and put a dog in there. It would say, no, you can't do that. Right, there's an array of cat. That's not a cat, it's a dog. All right? Uh, we're going to come to, again, if you're looking, some of you are looking like, whoa, what is all this stuff? We're going to come and see more and more examples of it, and you'll become more and more familiar with it. But these are key rules. If you have questions, don't hesitate to ask, whether you be online or you be in the room. All right. Now, declaring. When you declare an array, that's the way you declare it. That's an example of an array of what? An array of int. Int is a primitive type. You can see that example up there on the screen. Um, declare array of int. I'm going to go side by side here so people on the... Live stream can see a bit better. When you initialize it, you have to say, okay, this array, I've declared it, it's an array of values, and that's going to be an array of ints. And to initialize it, I say I have to create an array. So you use the new keyword. I think this is the first time in this class we've seen the new keyword, maybe. Um, we, get, we have to use the new keyword, which is going to create an object. That object is going to be an array of ints in this example up on the screen there. It's, and how big is it going to be? It's going to have eight elements in it. Now, remember, in computer science, we love to count from zero. So when we index that array, we actually index the first element as zero and the last element as seven. Okay, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. For weird computer science reasons, we tend to like indexing at zero. Okay, because we think of them as offsets. And so the first one is, there's no offset, it's right at the beginning. So the offset is zero. If you want to think of it that way, it becomes easy to think of it. Okay, so we think of it as an offset. The offset zero into the array, the offset one into the array, offset two into the array. That's the way we do it in many languages. In fact, most languages in computer science, we use zero in what's called the zero indexing. It's just a convention. Okay, um, then when we want to access it, if I want to access the fourth element of this array, I use three for the reason I just explained, because we're using zero indexing. So if I use the digit three, it means take the one at offset three, which is the fourth one. And then copying, there's a way we can copy using a thing called array copy. 
Operators, we have a bunch of operators in Java. We have the assignment operator, which you've seen lots in the examples I just did in the last half hour. You, each time I said x equals, and then I had a thing on the right-hand side that was assigned into x, right? And then I do stuff like, and then we've got arithmetic. We saw a little bit of arithmetic, and we're gonna see a bunch load more in a few minutes. Um, and we've got a plus sign. Uh, th th these are unary, oper uh, these are arithmetic operators, they're binary operators. A binary operator means that the plus sign has one thing on either side of it, right? If I say plus, I've got an A and a B, and you say plus, right? Um, minus, you've got an A and a B and a plus, or it could be C and D or X and Y or whatever. But you've got two things, with, and, and that, that operator sits in between them, okay? This, is, this should be familiar to you just from high school maths or whatever, the idea of an operator being a plus, a minus, a divide, and that percent sign, which means what? Can anyone remember what that percent sign means in Java? Yeah, integer remainder, right? You take an integer division and then take a, give us the remainder. So it's the remainder from an integer division, which is close to, but not the same as modulus. And then next thing is the unary operators. This is when you've got a value and you've just got one operator in front. Now, minus, you all understand what minus means, because again, you did that in, in like in elementary school, primary school maths. You put a minus sign in front of the number seven, what are we talking about? We're talking about a negative seven, right? You're familiar with the idea of a minus sign, not necessarily meaning subtraction, but being the sign on the value, right? So it's a negative number as opposed to a positive number. We can also do the same with a plus sign, which is usually redundant, because normally it's implied. When you write the number seven, it's implied that it's a positive seven, not a negative seven. But in Java, if you want to be really sure, make it sure it'd be very really explicit, you can put a plus in front of your seven, say this is really a positive plus. We don't normally do that, but you can if you want. And then we've got a plus plus, which means make this thing bigger by one. So if I say seven, I say plus plus, it means turn this seven into an eight. Um, and if I use minus minus, it does the op opposite. It, it reduces it by one. So if I take this seven minus minus, it'll, be, it'll give us the result six. And then we've got an exclamation mark, which means not. Okay, it means the opposite. It means it, it, take the opposite value. Okay, so, yep. Um, it, it makes sense in binary, but not in other numbers. So if in, in binary, if, 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 well, for, for, for a Boolean value, it's really obvious. If I say not or false, that's true, right? It's the inverse of false, it's true. And if you have a binary value, you could, you could do a bitwise uh, not, which would be flipping each of the values. Um, we've got equality, relational, conditional, and instance of, um, double equals. Really important, double equals means these two things are the same thing. Very, very important. We're going to come to it later. You're going to get caught by this. Probably a lot of you are going to trip and fall and fall and flatten your face on this thing because it's subtle. Okay? Double equals is what you probably think it means, but there's a, uh, is not necessarily what you think it means. There's another thing in Java which is E-Q-U-A-L-S, spelt out, equals, which is do these things actually have the same meaning, if you like? Are they basic, uh, not are they the exact same thing, but are these objects this representing the same thing, okay? There's a subtle difference. It might sound way pedantic, but this is actually important later on, okay? And double equals means these are the exact same thing. X is the same as Y. It's actually the same X, the same thing we're talking about. This will become clearer later. I'm going to give an example in a few minutes. And then we've got um, not equals. Um, we've got greater than, greater than or equal to, less than, less than or equal to. Double and is a logical and, means true and false or true, and then we've got the double, the vertical bars means or, so you can say true or false. And we've got instance of. Instance of is a really useful operator which says, is this thing an instance of cat? I mean, someone's given me an animal. I don't know, they, they just said it was an animal, but I know that in our universe of our program, there are cats and dogs. So I can say instance of cat, and it will true, return true or false. This is an instance of cat or it's not, okay? And so that's a good way to check when someone gives you an animal, is this actually a cat animal or is this a dog animal? You can use instance of to find that out, okay? Very, very useful operator. And then we've got bitwise operators. When you go and deal with a binary number, you can do, um, what have we got there? We've got the tilde, which means invert, so it means flip the bits. You've got an ampersand, which means do a logical and on each bit between these two numbers. We've got uh, the hat, which means XOR, which means uh, take the XOR value of each bit bitwise across th these two numbers. Um, the vertical bar, which means do a logical OR of these two numbers. Then you've got shift um, left, which means shift all the bits upwards. We've got shift right, which means shift all the bits downwards. And then we've got logical shift right. And um, logical shift right means shift them downwards and put zeros at the top as you move the thing rightwards. Um, whereas the other one means continue whatever the sign bit was. And we'll talk about sign bits more later, but a sign bit could be one or a zero. And, and when you do that, it will maintain the sign bit as you shift the number to the right. Yep. Back to the previous slide. Yep. Why do we want to use a new keyword instead of just int? 
Uh, why do we want to use a new keyword? That's a great question from online. Why do we use a new keyword here? Well, the answer is that we're creating a new object. Why are we creating a new object? That's another whole thing. But the way Java works, arrays are objects of a special kind. And in Java, whenever you make an object, you have to tell Java, hey, I want a new object. And the way you do that is using the new keyword. And that's just part of the language, okay? So an array is a special kind of object. And if you want to create an array, you must say new. Great question though. Ah, uh, interestingly enough, and you're going to see it in a few minutes for the person online who asked that great question, is that we um, can also make an array where we declare the array statically. So we don't just say, create me an empty new array. We can actually say, here's an array with these values in it. We're going to, it'll become clearer when I go through a concrete example shortly. Alrighty, expressions. An expression is a construct that evaluates a single value. So I say a plus b or you know, 2 plus 5, that's an expression and it evaluates to a value 7. Okay, 2 plus 5 is an expression that evaluates to 7. Um, they can be made up of variables like x and y, operators, plus, minus, whatever, um, and method invocations. I can call a method. We haven't done methods yet, but we're getting there. I can call a method like, um, you know, add, or I could call a method like, um, you know, give me a new number, and, 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 and so it can be method invocation is, is, is a kind of expression. Compound expressions follow precedence rules. You would have done, again, you would have done this in elementary school, primary school, mathematics, you use parentheses. If you say um, five plus three times two, which way do you mean it? If you want to be really clear, you say five times two and then plus three, or you might want to say it the other way around. But you use parentheses to disambiguate, okay? Because these are binary operators, and where do they apply? Well, there are precedence rules, just like there are in mathematics that you would have learned when you're at school. Same thing here, but if you want to be really clear, the really easy way to do it is to use parentheses, and then it becomes absolutely unambiguous. That's a compound expression, so an expression made up of expressions. And again, this might sound a bit fancy, but it's stuff you're deeply familiar with from primary school, from school, okay? Be building up numbers out of other expressions. A statement is a complete unit of execution. Uh, an expression statement um, will be ending with a semicolon in Java. If you've written in Python, you'll know that in Python we don't do that. Um, but in Java, we always end with a semicolon. Um, we, can, um, we can have a Simon expression, you say x equals 5. We can use plus plus or minus minus. We can say x plus plus, that's, a, that's an expression in its own, which means make x bigger by 1. Um, we can say y minus minus, which means, uh, with a semicolon, which means make y smaller by 1. We can invoke a method, we can say um, do the thing, semicolon, and that is an expression in, its own, in itself. And we can create an object. As you saw before, we can say new object, semicolon, and we've created a new object. We can declare things. You would have seen already, I say int x. That's a declaration saying int is a variable, and it, uh, sorry, x is a variable, and its type is int. And we can have control flow statements. Control flow statements, we're going to talk about in much more detail soon. That's things like if and while and so forth, which allows us to change the flow of control. So far, everything we've done in this course, in this first week, has been what we call sequence. The other thing we have is selection, and then we have iteration. I mentioned those concepts on Monday. They're coming up soon. So far, all the examples I've given you have just shown sequence. We do this line, then we do this line, then we do this line. But once we get to, um, like next Monday, we'll do things like the if statement, which will say we'll actually have selection, or we'll do the while statement, or the, do, uh, the for statement, which allows us to do iteration. Okay, and th those things are called control flow statements. A block, a block is a very simple idea. It's a bit like how you use parentheses in mathematics to group together ideas. You can use a, 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 a brace, what we call a brace, which is the curly bracket. Uh, we can use braces to group together a whole lot of expressions, a whole lot of statements, I'm sorry, to make the equivalent of one statement, okay? So if you put a series of statements inside of curly braces, that will be, have the effect of being one statement. Can anyone think of an example where I've used these curly braces? You've actually seen it again and again and again so far in the class, yep. Yeah, the main method, right? So the main method is actually executing one compound statement, which is the block, which is all that code that's sitting inside of those curly braces. So conceptually, it's taking that and saying, oh, that's a, that, that, that's a statement. It's a logically one statement um, that the main method is. But actually, we've busted it up into a bunch of statements and, and grouped them together with the curly braces. Okay? And you can do that wherever you want in Java, actually. You can make a, just a little block, and, and it will treat it as if it's one statement. Okay, so it's a grouping idea. Just like you use parentheses in mathematics, it's just a very handy way of grouping things together and say, treat this as a logical unit. The random class, why on earth would you want a random class? A random class provides a pseudo-random number generator, not a random number generator, because we don't have random numbers in computer science, we have ones that are pseudo-random. Why are they pseudo-random? Because they're not actually completely mathematically random, they're, they just look pretty random, okay? Why would you want this anyway? Why would you want random numbers? Pardon? Yeah, 
for generating a password maybe, but also for things like a game, right? If you have a game, you don't want the game to be exactly the same every time you play it. You want some ra randomness, right? And a, a random number generator will help us to do that. Imagine you're playing a dice game. You can use a random number generator to give you a value between zero and, and si uh, one and six, right? Which is a dice. Or flip a coin, give you a boolean, which is random, okay? Now they're pseudo-random, meaning that there's some very, very fancy mathematics there, including some of which was developed by one of our great uh, ANU professors, uh, Richard Brent. You can read a lot about him on Wikipedia. Richard Brent, he developed, uh, did a lot of work in, in pseudo-random num number generation, ones that look really random, but are actually tractable to do in a real computer. More recently, people are using really crazy physics to generate things that are actually closer and closer to real random things inside of computers. And as a person at the front suggested, one of the applications of random numbers is actually in security. It's very useful sometimes to have random numbers. I'm not going to go into that yet. We'll come back to it actually later in the course. But random numbers have a very useful role in security, um, which is surprising and interesting. Anyway, you can optionally provide a seed for your random number. So your random numbers are always the same. That sounds strange. The whole, the whole purpose of random numbers to be, is to be different. Okay, what I mean by the same is it means that if you flip the dice and it became heads, tails, 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 heads, then next time you run the program, it'd be the exact same sequence. That is actually useful, okay? That particular sequence is kind of random, but you can repeat that exact same sequence again using a seed. Why would you want that? Anyone? Yep? Um, let's say you have a bug. Um, you had a what? Like you have a bug that yeah, if you had a bug, that's exactly right. Hole in one. It, when you have a bug, and the bug happens in a program that uh, has a random number generator, and you run the program again, it doesn't happen. A seed will help you reproduce the bug by making the program behave the same way next time, which you might not want to do if you're actually making a game for someone because you don't want the game to always look the same. But for debugging, it's really useful because it means you can make the same sequence of random numbers, they're actually pseudo-random, appear one, uh, one after the other. Okay? And you can generate different types. You can generate ints, you can generate booleans. Booleans like a, a coin toss. Uh, you could use an int here, and that, in that example there, we see it becoming in a range between 0 and 9. You could use 0 to 5 inclusive, which is and add 1 to it, and you've suddenly got yourself a, a die, right? All right, mini quiz time. Let's see if I can make this thing work. Piazza is not the friendliest thing in the world. Uh, let's just see how we go here. Publish the poll. With a bit of luck, that will work. If it doesn't work, you can tell me. And now we're going to flip to do some coding. For a few moments, I want to just code one little chunk of this stuff. I'm going to have to do some catch up here, folks. Um, I'm going to start off with a Waterloo Visualizer, actually, um, because the Waterloo Visualizer is a great way to illustrate what I want to do here. We'll go to the Friday lecture. By the way, notice, folks, here, this here and how it, well, it's gone already because I already clicked on it. But notice here, it tells you what lab we had this week. It tells you a whole bunch of homework exercises. Do you have to do the homework exercises in this class? Does anyone know the answer? No, you do not. They're there for you. If you want to do them, I'm providing them there for you to help you learn. If you don't want to do them, that's your problem. You know, it's totally up to you. It's 100% your choice whether you do them or not. But they're there, and they're rich examples. And remember, this is like learning the violin or whatever. You need to practice, okay? So if you're not practicing, then you won't get so far. So let's go here, and there's an example here, I think. Um, where are we? This is the Waterloo Visualizer, remember? By the way, if you scroll up, you can see the Monday's lectures. Remember this. All the lectures are here, neatly organized by topic. Okay, we go here, we're going to go into arrays, and I'm not going to use this really big, complicated, fancy example. Um, what I'm going to do instead is I want to write it out by hand. Okay, we're going to declare an array D, and then we're going to instantiate the array. Oops, that's right, I've got to use spaces here in this world of visualizer. I'm going to say D equals new um, double five. Okay, what is that doing? Can anyone remember what that means if I do that? Someone else? Someone in the gloom at the back of the hall? What's, what's this doing? Folks, as we go along, I'm going to be asking more and more for your input. Yeah, great question. Uh, what do you think? You have to shout though, unfortunately, because the air conditioning's loud and, I, and I'm half deaf. Yep. Yeah, it's going to create an array of doubles, and that array is going to be of size five, right? It's going to be five elements in the array, and they're going to be doubles. Okay, great. And then what we can do is we can, um, we can say something like this. We can say, um, well, let's just, let's just visualize this. Okay, this is really helpful. I strongly recommend you use a visualizer for this, because there are concepts here that are hard for people to understand, okay? That are really quite hard for people to understand, and the visualizer really helps with these concepts. Okay, so we've declared the thing up here, and now we're creating it. Look at what happens. Step, okay, there it is. 
it's created an object, which is shown in a kind of yellow over there. It's created that object. And, um, and what are the values in the object? They're all zero, because in Java, we always initialize stuff with zeros to start with, okay? And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, um, oops, go back and edit, edit the code. I'm gonna edit this code here. And then what we're gonna say is we're gonna say um, D uh, zero uh, equals um, five something like that, okay? And what that should do is put the value five, oops, what have I done here? Um, it should, I just chose a random number, by, by the way. Uh, there's nothing special about five. But what you see here is when we put that value zero, uh, five into the zeroth element, we got a five sitting in there. Can you see that? And that changed that from a zero to a five. Now, here comes the part, one of the parts I really want you to concentrate on, because this is interesting and maybe surprising, okay? Yep. Oh, great question. I'm not going to answer it right now. Um, but what, the, uh, b what this, the question was, what is this, this stuff here? And we see this again and again and again. That's boilerplate. And what it allows you to do is to pass arguments on the command line. Okay, if you're executing this from the command line. We're not doing that here. Um, you can also do it in IntelliJ as well. But we're not going to concentrate on that just yet. We'll come to it later. For the moment, just consider it to be boilerplate junk that you have to do in Java. But you can access these arguments. So they're arguments that you provide to the program. Very good question. So um, we're nearly done, folks. But I just want to finish this little part here off. So now what we're going to do is we're going to declare a new array called E, which is doubles. Then what we're going to do is we're going to do an assignment like this. Now, quickly tell me what you think is going to happen here. What's going to happen when we visualize this? And furthermore, what's going to happen when I do this? Okay, answers? What are we going to see when I visualize this? Yep. Great answer up the back there. What I hear from the back, I'll just say it out loud because it's really, it is quite hard to hear at the front here. Um, what the person in the back says, it's going to create a pointer, right? It's going to create a pointer. Um, it's going to create a pointer. And um, we don't know what a pointer is yet in this class. I haven't told you. But another way to, to say it is it's going to create a reference. And so actually E and D are referring to the same array. It's not two arrays, E and D. Okay? It's two references to one array. How do I know that? Or how did he know that? Well, because I only created one array. It's right here. There's only one new there. So we've only made one array in this world, but we've got two ways of referring to it. One is through D and one is through E. Okay? It's a very strange and interesting concept and very important one to understand. It's really easy to visualize in the visualizer and hard to understand if you don't have something like the visualizer. So there we go. We've created this array D. So there's D. It's referring, using a, what we call a pointer, it's referring to this array here. We've in initialized the zeroth element of D. What's going to, and, and then what we've done is we've created a new variable E, and look, it's referring to the same array. E is referring to the same array. Okay, what happens now if I, if I set the zeroth element of, of E to seven? What's going to happen now, folks? The, the zeroth element is going to turn to seven. Yeah, that's right. So like that. Okay, so when this changed to a seven. All right. So um, this is a very important concept. One last thing I'm going to do here before we go, because uh, we, I know we're, we're right on time here, um, is I'm going to do one more thing. I'm going to say E equals new double, say, 8. Okay? And then we'll say E 0 equals 13. All right, like that. And now what's going to happen, I'll walk through this pretty quick, and then we've got to go into our bio. Oops, what happened? Uh, I typo, I forgot to put the semicolon. Remember, every statement in Java needs a semicolon. If you write Python, that might catch you out, because in Python, that's not true. So we're doing this now. Waiting, waiting for Waterloo. <laughs> hmm. I'm just gonna, oops, what happened? <laughs> I'm not sure what happened. There should, should, there shouldn't, there's not, I don't think there's anything wrong with my pro program here, it's just, uh, that's strange. All right, let's just make this three. I don't know why they did that. I have not the faintest idea what's happening to the poor old Waterloo visualizer. I might have to report a bug. <laughs> okay, but if, what we should have happened is we get E pointing to a new array, which is of size three. And then when I set E zero to 13, 
it will offset the, um, the zeroth element. And, and unfortunately, the, very sadly, the Waterloo visualizer is, is unhappy. I'll try and fix this offline and send you an answer. Before you all go and all run away, let me and have a great weekend. The bio for today, fantastic person. Margaret Hamil Hamilton is one of my champions of computer science. In fact, if you come to my office, you'll see there's a big picture of her. That, in fact, that very same uh, photograph is there in, uh, right near my office on one of the, the doors. Um, she was the person who was responsible for the writing of the, um, the Apollo flight software, which is the software that was used to get the um, moon lander on the moon. And that giant pile of paper next to it, anyone know what that is? That's a program. Someone was asking about programs before. That is a program. What program is it? That is the program that took the Apollo spaceship to the moon back in, 19, in the 1960s, 69. Okay? And she was responsible, she was at MIT, and she led the, the team that built the software. That's a printout of the program. In those days, that's how you debug, by printing stuff out. That's a printout of the program that was used to land on the moon. And she led that team. Okay? One of the great champions of computer science. And she's also a great software engineer. Um, in fact, she's credited with even coining the word software engineering. You all heard the word software engineering? Margaret Hamilton. Okay? One of our heroes of computer science and another person that I want you all to learn about. Now, folks, have a fantastic weekend. You've earned a break. Um, I'll see you all on Monday, whether you be on the stream or you be in the room. I'm really looking forward to seeing you. And um, if you didn't get everything done this week, please, please, please try and catch up. I don't want you to get left behind, okay? All right, and if you have any questions, feel free to come to see, after, see me afterwards. Oh, one last thing, class reps, if you wanted to be a class rep, your chance to do it is running out, okay? There's a link on the bottom of the webpage, which I showed you before, and uh, to fill in a form. If you'd like to do it, fill in that form, and I'll, I'll um, make announcements on Monday, I hope, okay? Have a great weekend.